Hello, party people, and welcome to an Office Hours speed round where I go through and I answer a bunch of questions rapid fire. There are a bunch of things built up in the queue. Brown Log Pinball, welcome to the club. Good to see folks in here. We got Surly Dev from over across the pond, CTI Geek from uh, Virginia. So let's see what we got piled up in the queue that we can go through rapid fire because... There's some questions in there that are fairly straightforward. So we'll start out with Elaine who asks, Hi Brent, I started the restore of a large database. It took two hours before the restore actually started. What was SQL Server doing all that time? Answer's really simple. It asked Windows to grow out the data files and log files. Make sure you turn on instant file initialization. And the fact that you don't have that turned on tells me you haven't run my free SP Blitz health check. Go run a health check across your SQL Server servers, you'll find all kinds of things that will improve performance, uh, not just that. Uh, hi, Ashish, good morning there. Next up, the questioner asks, how do I see the actual execution plan for the top query in SP Blitz cache? Answer simple, you have to run it. SQL Server won't show you the actual plans until SQL Server 2019. SQL Server 2019 has a last actual plan option that you can turn on. Just got to be really careful about turning that on. And I explain why in my class, how I use the first responder kit, which is totally free. When you use tools, you want to read the documentation, and that How I Use the First Responder Kit class is your documentation for that. Good morning, Shane. Good to see you again. Joseph asks, Hi, Brent. Why don't you want to have kids? Because I'm spoiled, because I have a car collection, and I like to vacation all over the world, and that would require me to make sacrifices, and I don't want to make sacrifices. <laughs> Mastering Column Store Fundamental says, is it foolish to put a non-clustered column store in to index on a table with only hot data? There's a very simple answer for this. Go attend my Fundamentals of Column Store class. Go attend that, and I teach you when it makes sense to put data in Column Store. Generally speaking, if your table only has hot data, Column Store probably doesn't make sense. Oh, hey, Mr. TCS, thanks for uh, the subscription there. That's <laughs> early depth says I'd rather have a car in the lounge than Lego sets. This is also true as well. Barath says, I manage a 17 terabyte database where one table holds most of the data. When I rebuild a three terabyte table index offline, it takes three days. Yeah. Don't do that. Go watch Brent Ozar Fragmentation videos. Go to YouTube, search for Brent Ozar Fragmentation. I'll explain why. That isn't going to be the thing that gets you across the finish line. It just simply isn't going to work. Stop trying to rebuild a 3 terabyte object offline. That just doesn't make sense. Quasi Ted asks, I was hired to move a, da a database as 2.5 terabytes on SQL Server 2008. Uh, I want to move it to 2022, but I can't shrink it to get rid of a 2 terabyte wasted space so that you can add to the AG. When you say you can't shrink it, you want to give things like the error message that you're getting or the specific problem that you're having. Stop distracting with all these other things you're talking about. The database is this size. It was 2008. I was a young man when I learned how to ride a unicycle. Boil your question down to the thing that matters. When you say you can't do something, say why you can't do it. Don't tell me what the color of your hair is. I only got so much time. Dick Bowen says, what is the benefit of running simple recovery model versus full recovery model? The ability to do point in time recovery. If you want to recover to exactly 9.43 a.m. last Tuesday, full recovery model is going to be the thing that gets you there. Otherwise, simple recovery model only gets you to the last time that the full backup ran. Databases uh, you are usually backed up only like once or twice a day with full backups. Your business would probably be pretty pissed off if you lost hours worth of data. Not in all cases, sometimes you uh, don't care about point-in-time recovery, so you don't want to deal with uh, running transaction log backups. So in that case, you just want to run a simple recovery model because you're okay losing hours worth of data, which is true in some uh, database servers. 
Uh, let's see here. Next up, Doe Pinder says, what's your favorite backup technology for SQL Server in uh, the case of VMs? Sand snapshots by a long shot. Sand snapshots is the way to go for multi-terabyte databases. If you can't do storage snapshots, VSS snapshots, then everything else is going to be a compromise and everything else is going to suck once you hit the multi-terabyte levels. Uh, next up, T-SQL querying asks, why does too small of a block size increase I.O. latency? Think about it in just plain old pieces of paper. If I gave you a stack of pieces of paper that were about these size, and I said, how quickly can you write these to disk? You'd be doing a whole, say that I gave you war and peace. That I told you, let me rewind that. Say that I gave you a 1,000 word blog post and I told you write it down on pieces of paper and commit those to disk. 1,000 words is going to take a while because you're going to have a lot of little pieces of paper. You're going to work on the first paper, get that to disk, work on the next paper, get that to disk. It's going to take you a long time to write all those little pieces of paper down to disk because you're going to have to issue so many write requests. Whereas if you have a larger piece of paper that happens to fit the size of that 1,000 word blog post, then you just write it and you issue one write request and you're done. Less write requests means generally faster I.O. latency. Kind of butchered that explanation in the beginning, but hopefully there we go, we recovered. Uh, next up, Culloden says, my Brent is moving their analytics fa uh, environment to Fabric. We plan to use SQL DB in Fabric. Do the skills developed through your courses transfer to Fabric SQL DB? I have no clue. Because right now, I think that only a moron would use Fabric in, or use SQL DB in Fabric. I am personally not a moron, so I have not played around with it. But it looks like suicide to me, the way that they do their capacity provisioning and throttling. That just looks suicidal. It is not something that I recommend. Next up, my tea got cold says, is it still recommended to change the processor scheduling settings in Windows to give the best performance to background settings? That's like asking, do you still beat your wife? I'll give you a minute to answer that question. Do you? Do you still beat your wife? Oh, you're stammering right now. Because you're like, no, I never beat my wife. Right, I never recommended this either. I don't know where this terrible advice came from. Never made any sense to me. I don't understand why people would even waste time doing that. So no, I don't, I've never recommended that. Uh, Ignite Bound says, will you be going to Ignite this year in San Francisco? No, to me, Microsoft Ignite is a marketing conference. I have spoken at TechEd, which was the predecessor to that, and I know firsthand from being throttled by their marketing department, Microsoft will only let certain messages go out through the podium. And so this one's going to be a little bit longer than a speed round question. I'll give you a little background story. I went to go teach a session once at TechEd, and the session that the team product team had agreed for me to give was uh, uh, how to fix slow SQL servers. And the marketing department who runs that event said to me, no, Brent, uh, we need you to change something. There, there are no slow SQL servers. I was like, oh, uh, uh, what? They said, yeah, no, no, no. You can talk about building the fastest SQL servers, but there are no slow SQL servers. I was like, uh, okay, all right. They vetted my slides, wanted to make sure everything was on brand for marketing. And then leading up to the event, this was coming up to the uh, launch of the Microsoft Surface, and the marketing team said, uh, got everybody, all the speakers together, and they said, hey, just in case anybody asks you how you feel about the Surface, you're, you're to respond by saying you're not allowed to talk about it, but you're very, very excited about it. I'm like, whoa. And they were programming the speakers from marketing, like, here's what you have to say. And suddenly, the whole thing around Microsoft events started to make sense to me. I understand why they talk the way that they do, why it's not really actionable, real-world information out there. It's all press releases and marketing junk. Uh, so there's no value to me to that. The only value would be networking. If you want to get hired by Microsoft, or if your company is just paying for Microsoft events and you want to go party in San Francisco, knock yourself out. But in in terms of actionable information that will get your career ahead, it ain't coming from the podium. Your best bet, or as, as Surly Dev says, lectern. 
uh, uh, your best bet would be to talk, talk to the speakers afterwards, whether they're Microsoft employees or someone else, and get them to talk off the record, and then you'll be able to get some vague semblance of truth. Otherwise, it's just marketing spam garbage. Uh, let's see, we'll do another one or two uh, speed round questions. <laughs> Dopinder says, what are the top things you see people temporarily resize their uh, Azure VM for some operation and then resize it back down after completion? Tends to be things like monthly tasks. I got one client who does it. They need to import a whole bunch of data. They do it exactly one day a month. After those imports finish, they resize the thing back down. Other times that I see it is for businesses with peak loads, like imagine this Ticketmaster isn't my client, but imagine that Ticketmaster, you work for Ticketmaster, you need a whole bunch of capacity leading up to when you go uh, launch Taylor Swift's new concert series, temporarily throw a whole bunch of capacity in and then resize it back down after you're done for like sales events. Uh, those are the top two that I see all the time. Uh, and then we'll do, let's see here, one more. Let's find one other uh, uh, fast one that I can answer. Steve asks, uh, can you settle an age-old argument, tabs versus spaces? I used to be team spaces. Today, I am 100% team tabs because it's an accessibility issue. It turns out the people who use Braille screen readers, these, they may make these little Braille screen readers where you move your finger across and you can read the stuff on the screen. Spaces take up a whole ton of space, whereas a tab takes up just one character. So they can read more code per line more easily. Now, I may never have anyone read my code with a Braille screen reader, but if anyone does, I would like to think that I did something that made their life a little bit easier. Doesn't really cost me anything. So that was the thing that switched me over to Team Tabs. Uh, Surly Dev says visually impaired. I'm not sure what I. Oh, yeah, no, Surly Dev says the same thing. Team tabs if you care about visually impaired colleagues. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> MRTCS says I got a free Tina Turner concert from TechEd. I got. Um, who was it that was. Uh, was it Fallout Boy? I think Fallout Boy was one. There was another one in New Orleans. Uh, but then at the past Summit Conference, I got a fake Tina Turner concert. It was a Tina Turner impersonator who came out and sang Simply the Best, which was kind of hilarious. All right. Well, thanks for hanging out with me during this quick speed round. I am now off to go teach Fundamentals Week. I'm teaching the Fundamentals of Query Tuning class live today. So i got to go uh, set up for that. I will see you all at the next office hours. Adios.